Church at the Beach from the Lancaster family. Just want to let you all know that we're doing wonderful and great and can't wait to see all your lovely faces. You have a wonderful and blessed day and see you soon. Good morning, church. It's very sad not spending Easter together. It's going to be a very nice reunion. Just want to wish you all the best. Uh, it's been a trying time but we're gonna get through this as usual. God bless you all. I miss you all very much. See you soon. Mwah. Hello, Church at the Beach family. My family and I are doing well and I hope you are also. I'm looking forward to the time when we can be together again and back to our normal schedules. God bless you, goodbye. Good morning. I'm Pastor Greg George. Welcome to the Church at the Beach. You would not believe what would be seen if you walked down our hallway into what used to be called our foyer with a huge fountain that is now gone. And if you move on into the worship center, there's a beautiful color of gray and white that just pops. And if you go outside, you will find a palm tree that is literally anchored down. We're so glad to have you here to worship with us today at the Church at the Beach. All right. Do it for me one more time, guys. Our Awana mission is to go to love and to serve our Lord Jesus Christ. Good job. Very good. Hey, what's up, Church at the Beach family? TCATB students, Pastor John coming to you. I want to show you a little bit about what we're doing in the youth room. We're getting ready to create a fresh space for you guys when you come back, so let's go check it out. As you can see, we've got all this space right here to utilize for our students when they come back. We've got our little lounge coffee shop right here and right back here. We got all sorts of new little things to just make this feel a little more like their space and their home. So I'm excited for them to come back. I can't wait for them to come back. I can't wait for you guys to come back. But bear with us. Keep praying for us. We'll be back sooner than you think. Love you all. God bless. Hola Iglesia, bendiciones. Hello Church, blessings. Para nosotros es una bendición comunicarnos con ustedes. For us, it's a blessing to communicate with y'all. Este es un muy buen tiempo. This is a very good time. Para adorar a Dios. To worship the Lord. Cuando tú adoras a Dios. When you worship God. Cuando nosotros adoramos when a Dios. When we worship God. Reconocemos. We recognize. Lo que Dios ha hecho por nosotros. What God had made for us. Él ha hecho cosas grandes. He had made huge things. Poderosas. Powerful things. Por eso le adoramos. That's why we worship him. Somos una iglesia de adoración. We are a worship, worship church. Somos una iglesia que damos honor a Dios. We're a church that give honor to God. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, church. Bendiciones. Blessings. Good morning. Back in February, Sandy and I flew to Fairfax, Virginia, which is just west of D.C. to take care of our three grandchildren for a while while their parents, our children, went on a house hunting trip in California. Tyson, Peyton, and, and Hudson are 14, 12, and 10. And Sandy did most of the work as far as taking care of them, and I did most of the work as far as being their chauffeur, taking them back and forth to school and off to their, af their after school activities. One of the things we tried to do while we were there, we were spending 10 days with them exclusively, 
is to spoil them. Isn't that what grandparents are supposed to do? And so if they wanted to go out and eat, if they wanted to go participate in activity, we tried to do as much as we could to be able to make sure that those things happened. One of the things they wanted to do was to go bowling. So we took them to the bowling alley. I don't know about you, but it's been a long time since I've been in a bowling alley. You know they now have these things called bumpers that you put up on either side of the alley so that when you throw the ball down the alley, it doesn't end up in the gutter. It goes all the way down and hits a number of pins. I got to thinking about that. With the struggle we're in right now, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a spiritual bumper to keep us going, focused in the right direction? Now, if you've been with us in Bible study over the last couple of months, we studied First and Second Timothy and Titus and Philemon. Paul writes to Timothy in Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, and he says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. Now, when I was doing an in-depth study on that, one of the things I came up with in the translation for a sound mind was common sense. So during this time when we're supposed to be in our homes and limiting our activity, let's use common sense. If you have to go out, make sure you've got protection on. If you can't go out because of one reason or another, call the church office. We are here to serve you. If you need food, if you need medicine, if you need to go to a doctor's appointment, you need to go to the bank, whatever it is, and you don't have a neighbor that will step up and do it, call the church office at 234-8892, dial my extension, that's 205, and leave me a message. I'll get back with you as soon as I can.
the blood will never lose its power. Isn't it interesting that this week we'll be looking at that first day after the blood that was spilt and took our Lord's life and he appears to the ten in that room designated by him. Join me this morning as we look at a message entitled, I Can't Believe It. I Just Can't Believe It. I want to read the text to you this morning from Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. Join me there as we read. It is true, the two men from Emmaus said, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Verse 36, and while they were still talking about this, those things in the two previous verses, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bone as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still not believing because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of boiled fish. And he took it and he ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And then he opened their eyes so that they could understand the scriptures. Let's pray together. Father, today I thank you for being there for those who are sick, who need healing. In our church, we pray for Saul Williams. We pray for Jerry Dodd. We pray for Mary Loomis. Father, we also pray for our health care workers that you would provide protection for them. Lord, we pray today for our leaders that you would give them wisdom. We pray for our president and his staff, for Vice President Pence and the group that leads us in trying to do the very best for every place in our country. We pray for our churches and how to best serve and show the love of Christ. We pray for those folks in our church that have stepped forward and continued to be faithful in both tithing and in giving. Father, we pray for those that are vulnerable, for those who have been in touch with this virus, that it would pass over them, that you would keep them alive and healthy through it. And for those of us who are trying to resist contracting the virus. And then, Father, for those that are unemployed, Father, provide them provisions today. And we ask this in and through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. I just cannot believe this. It might sound like an unusual title, but I think that once we look at the message, it will make perfect sense. I think about some things lately that I haven't been able to believe. I can't believe it's not butter. How many of you have ever heard that term? Well, that was the coming on of a product that tasted so much like butter, it was hard to believe that it wasn't butter, and it was really good for you. But we've had some things like that in our recent days. I'll not forget when President Trump with Vice President Pence and the members of the Coronavirus Task Force first stood on television and announced the great sense of panic and the great sense of risk that all of us were at because of this virus. I remember looking at the charts and wondering who would be a part of the statistics that they announced. I watched them as they changed over the days and as bits and pieces of news seemed to confirm and contradict and the confusion that, for me at least, came. And then I began to wonder, I wonder if anyone else has been confused. So I contacted Pastor Rudy. 
And this is what Pastor Rudy said, and I quote, This is all what happened at Easter. First he said, I can't believe I ate the whole thing. Well, I think we all know the truth of that. Our neighbor has a hundred rolls of toilet paper. <laughs> I think we all remember that and could have been guilty of doing that. The next one I found real interesting. Corona beer is not a treatment for the virus. And of course, you know Rudy, he loves that one. And then finally, I've watched a marathon of Fox News and schools are out for the rest of the year. I just can't believe it. Now in the midst of all that we've been experiencing and that sense of I can't believe this-ness that we have, can you imagine what it must have been like on that first Easter at night when the ten men gathered in the room and while they were in the room discussing what all had been said and believed, Jesus appeared in their midst. In fact, the first point of today's message is the uniqueness of that particular room, of that room. In verses 34 and through 36, we first find there is an undeniable group of witnesses. In fact, you may not have realized this, but there are actually three witnesses there are the witnesses that come to us in the women and the women hearing and listening to the angel and the angel saying to them, he's not here, he's risen, just like he said. Also, the words in verse 34b, where Simon is reported to be one of the first witnesses of the resurrection. We don't find this anywhere else in the text except in Luke's gospel. But somehow this became known after the resurrection of our Lord and was recorded for us by Luke. But then the third witness is the witness of these two men on the road to Emmaus. Now, the reason I find all of this very interesting is because when we look at three witnesses, we find that three is a very special number. And it expresses something very, very unique. It expresses divine completeness in testimony. So in this undeniable set of witnesses, these three, this group of women that heard from the angels, Simon and the two men on the road to Emmaus, we find a divine completeness in testimony. They've heard all of this and it's on their mind and it says that they're talking about it. But then the second thing in the uniqueness of this room I want to bring up is the unbelievable appearance of our Lord in their midst. First, it says Jesus stood. Jesus stood in verse 36. That means that his arrival was one of all of a sudden, without them being aware, he stands in their midst. Now, on every other occasion, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, when something of this type of a theophany, which is just an earthly manifestation of a heavenly being, and in most cases that of an angel, there is this sense of radiance and whiteness of light. And all of a sudden, Jesus and that same appearance stands in their midst. And he stands there with this posture that would remind them of something that is supernatural and outside of normal experience. And then it says, he spoke. He spoke as angels always do, and as our Lord certainly instructs his messengers like angels to do, by first removing their fear. Now it's not in this particular recording, but in every other recording, the angel says, don't be afraid, or fear not. But the other thing, that Jesus did is he said peace be with you. Isn't it wonderful that when we have a unique experience with Jesus, when he supernaturally arrives in our life in the midst of panic and problems, maybe purely in your struggle and mine with sin, he has a word that quiets our spirit, a word that removes our fear, a word that reminds us that there is valid testimony to everything we're experiencing. 
Our second point today is the urging of Christ. When Christ makes this supernatural appearance in the midst of the disciples, it says, first, he confronted them. I want to read you these words from Mark's gospel, chapter 16 and verse 14. It said, later, Jesus appeared to the eleven. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand. Uh, this is later, and so they are assuming that the replacement for Judas is present and that Thomas is present but we know, in fact, on that first night, Thomas was not present, which means there were ten men. But later, Jesus appeared to the leaven as they were eating, and he rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Now, we know well that that's exactly what they were talking about when he showed up. That is what was being spoken of when they talked about the angels who talked to actually the women. When Simon, wherever and whenever it happened, was made aware of the risen Christ, and especially of those two men, Cleopas and another, on the road to Emmaus. And they had this type of evidence, this type of testimony, as I read to you, which is divine completeness in testimony, and yet they still had not believed. Now, another, translated, another translation of Mark 16, 14 says... They were upbraided. It means that Jesus really confronted them. And so in his urging, the first thing that he does is he confronts them because they have these disturbing thoughts and these doubting thoughts that make them not ready to believe the very Christ who was standing in front of them. And so Jesus first brings confrontation. But next he brings confirmation. He says, look at me. In fact, in verse 39, a very strong implication, handle me. Now, in the dress of first century, that which would be exposed would be, of course, the head and the face, most of the forearm down to the hand and the feet. And Jesus is actually giving them invitation. It is I myself, he says in this verse, he says, come, handle me or touch me. And as they begin to touch him, they can see him standing there. They can hear him speaking. And they begin to sense his presence by touching him that it was real and it was physical. Now, this is an illusion, of course. Back to that time when Jesus came after they had been struggling throughout the night and felt that the seas were going to overtake them and he came walking on the water. And you remember, when they looked up, they said, it's a ghost or an apparition. Now, this is more than what you and I usually think of as a ghost. Most of first century would see this as something called up by a median, someone who has been dead that's been brought back to life. And they were afraid. And yet... This same Jesus, this one who had a ghostly appearance or seemed to be a spirit, is saying, handle me. The handling of him begins to engage the senses of man. And while they're trying to receive that, he says, feed me. You got anything here to eat? He says in 41 to 43, and they brought him some broiled fish. Now always in the scripture, when they had the fish and the bread, you remember the disciples on the road to Emmaus became aware when Jesus did what? Broke bread. And now here, Jesus says, feed me, give me some fish. Well, the reason that this feeding of the 5,000 and this walking on the water that followed it is drawn back into their attention is because most scholars believe that is the point in the ministry of Jesus where he perceived the apostles as best understanding who he was and what his mission was. And so the second point is the urging of Jesus both in confrontation and then in this unbelievable confirmation by using all five of the senses. Taste, smell, sight, 
sound, all of these, and touch. Our Lord truly is urging us today to know He's here, to know He's present. When we're concerned and when we're worried, when things tend to make us afraid, when we just really don't understand or believe what's going on, He's here to confront us with our unbelief and to confirm belief based on verifiable evidence. In point one, we looked at the uniqueness of the room. In point two, we looked at the urging of Jesus in order to help us embrace what was going on in that room. But at the end of this experience of the ten, there's what I call the unction of the gospel. I ask about this word and someone said, that doesn't sound like a good word. But I want you to know it is the proper word. And I want you to read with me and understand why it's the proper word. In John's Gospel, chapter 20, in verse 21, it said again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. The unction of the Gospel is the sending forth by his blessing of the disciples, the giving of the Spirit by him to his disciples to go forth and share the good news of the gospel. It was a good news that began in the Garden of Eden when God began to provide a way for sinful man to be back in right relationship with holy God. It talks about how God would ultimately fulfill that lamb who slain before the foundation of the world and perfectly work out the one and only sacrifice in Christ his Son that had just taken place on Calvary. And in the resurrection, verified that he had power over sin and death in the grave. And now that same task is being given to the apostles to go from that room and be those anointed. That's what the word unction means. It means to be anointed by God and sent forth to share the good news of the gospel. In fact, just as God had sent Jesus, Jesus now, as the Christ, sends the apostles. There is a song that, as far back as I can remember, has touched my life. I wanted to read the words of just two verses of this song to you. So send I you to labor unrewarded, to serve unpaid, unloved, unsought and unknown to bear rebuke or suffer scorn and scoffing so send I you to toll for me alone the last verse is gripping so send I you to bear my cross with patience can you imagine how that must ring in the ears of those disciples that they are to bear their cross if they're going to follow Jesus. For they remember, he said, if anyone's going to come after me, let him deny himself and what? Take up his cross and follow me. So send I you to bear my cross with patience. And then one day with joy to lay it down. To hear my voice, well done, my faithful servant. Come share my throne, my kingdom, and my crown. As the Father hath sent me, so send I you. God has sent every one of us who've put our faith and trust in Him out to share the good news of the gospel. That thing that transformed you from a person of darkness into a person of light, which moved you from the temporal and the condemnation of the eternal to that which had life everlasting with God. What a great, great promise is ours there. So I conclude today, when we embrace the way of the risen Christ, in this lesson we can find three things. First, we find that we exchange panic for peace. 
Have you come to the Lord in such a way during these days of COVID-19 where your panic can be replaced with His peace? Because you know that whatever occurs, He's got it. The war has already been fought and won and He loves you and God is sovereign. And in the midst of that knowledge, we can find Peace in the midst of panic. He's also come, secondly, to ask you to exchange unbelief for belief. You know, this past week I had someone make a comment to me. I'm beginning to be a little bit more optimistic about how things are going to happen. Do you need to make that transition from unbelief to belief to realize that this virus was no surprise to God? These Threatening situations are no surprise to God. And if the one who didn't bear his own, his own son but gave him freely up for all of us, will he not give us all things? Does that call you and call me to move from unbelief to belief? And then the last and possibly the most important to exchange purposelessness for purpose. You know, when we are threatened in our temporal situation, when the occurrences of our ordinary and everyday yet limited life are threatened and we have nothing more, it's a scary thing. It's a panic-piercing thing. But when we know that we are God's child, and we are both gifted and spirit-filled to accomplish kingdom work, and God has given each of his children who he calls and he saves purpose, and we follow that purpose, we have something to live for no matter what's going on in our personal life or in the life of our world. So this morning, I encourage you to look up and realize that Jesus is still present. And even if it may be something that it's hard to believe, I can tell you, he has the solution to every problem you and I might find in our life. As the Father has sent me, Jesus said, even so send I you. The great news about Easter Sunday evening is that a group of disciples, disturbed and afraid, have been sent by the Lord to bear the good news of the gospel. I wonder, do you know the Lord, and has he sent you? If not, ask him into your heart today. Pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for rising victorious over sin, death, and the grave. Thank you for forgiving me my sin. Thank you for coming in and living in my heart. Thank you for saving me today. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being a part of our service here today at the church at the beach.